Paddington peered gloomily at the contents of his money box. The one belonging to the man outside had sounded remarkably full, whereas there was hardly enough in his own to keep him in rolls for a day, let alone buy any birthday presents. With only two days to go before Mr. Brown's birthday, things looked very bleak indeed. Mr. Brown was looking forward to his birthday, and Paddington wanted to buy him something nice. Even the book his friend Mr. Gruber had lent him didn't help matters. It was called A Thousand Ways of Making Money. And although there were some very good chapters, not one of them suggested how you could do it if you were in a hurry. Besides, it was very hard to concentrate with all the noise going on downstairs. Finally, he could stand it no longer, and he decided to investigate the matter. Which was how he came to overhear Mr. Brown say something that set his mind working. The nerve of it. I gave that man tenpence, and he as good as said it wasn't enough. It's the quickest way of earning money I've ever seen. All he has to do is turn a handle. Now, if it had been a one-man band, that would have been different. Haven't seen one of those for ages. Paddington put on his thoughtful expression. The one he reserved for those occasions when he had an idea coming on. He didn't appear again for the rest of that evening. He had some important practicing to do. Practicing that was best done under the bed covers, in case other people had different ideas on the subject. The very next day, Paddington set off with high hopes of earning enough money to buy something nice for Mr. Brown. However, it wasn't long before he found that he was barking up the wrong tree. Paddington eyed his takings gloomily. He was an optimistic bear at heart, but even so he had to admit that two buttons and a French franc wouldn't buy Mr. Brown much of a present. He was about to give it up entirely when he heard the sound of laughter coming from a nearby house. It sounded as though there was a party going on, and where there was a party, there were people. He decided to have one last go. beginning to think you'd never come. I'm a Mrs. Smith Chomley. The chef's been here for ages, and so have all the guests. We've all been waiting for you. I say, are you all right? It sounds as though you have something wrong with your throat. I do hope you're not getting a cold. The agency told me they were short of waiters, but really. Now, oh, come along. I'm not a waiter. I'm a bear. Oh, there you are. Now, have you done much waiting? Paddington considered the matter for a moment or two. I've done quite a lot this evening, he said truthfully. Oh, dear. I was hoping you'd arrive all nice and fresh. Oh, I had a bath only last week, said Paddington. And Mrs. Bird gave me a going over with the vacuum cleaner. Well, I'm afraid there isn't time to do anything about it now. 
Though what the guests will think, I really don't know. Vladimir? My goodness. Organzi Platovich. Now, Vladimir, there's no need to be like that. I have some very important guests this evening, and they've been kept waiting quite long enough. They have been waiting. <laughs> what about me? I, Vladimir, what have cooked for the crowned heads of Europe. Am I to end up like this? Working, vicious, bear? Vladimir, the soup. As you wish. You are the boss, Mitch. Hold out your paw. Not that way. The other way up. My goodness, Blatters. How can I work this way? Paddington made a dive for his suitcase. There was a very good chapter in Mr. Gruber's book on how to be a waiter and what to do in an emergency, including a whole list of jokes to tell when things went wrong. But before he had time to read more than a page or two, he began to feel something warm creeping up his left arm. He didn't have to look far to find the reason. Quick, quick, make me the servings. Already I'm having troubles Meet mine Pastanovich. Paddington didn't know about Vladimir's Pastanovich, nor did he greatly care. He had enough problems of his own. He had never seen so many plates of soup at one time, and he hardly dared breathe, let alone say anything. doing in the garden? I'm afraid, said Paddington. I got locked out. I must have taken the wrong turn by mistake. Oh, Daphne, fancy having the soup served by a bear in a duffel coat and from the garden, too. Whatever gave you the idea? I suppose you could say it came over me. I think this soup will, too, if nobody takes it, warned Paddington. I may have to let go. He consulted his book again. There seemed to be quite a lot about how to put soup into bowls, but nothing at all about how to get rid of the bowls once they were full. And none of the waiters in the illustrations ever seemed to carry more than two at a time. Quick, everyone. The waiter's having trouble with his soup. Come and get it. Much to Paddington's relief, he began to feel the weight being taken off his left arm. Waiter, this soup's cold. I know, said Paddington. I put my paw in it just now and it was freezing. Waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Shh, not so loud. They'll all want one. I've got a creepy crawly in mine. What's it doing? Paddington peered at the bowl. I think that's the breast stroke, he announced. You're lucky, Mildred. I just found a twig floating in mine. I expect that's because it came from the supermarket, said Paddington. They've got branches everywhere. I think it's delicious, Daphne. You must let me have the recipe. I'll ask the chef if you like, said Paddington. I expect it's written on the package. Mr. Vladimir, Mr. Vladimir, gooey, Mr. Vladimir. I'm back, Mr. Vladimir, Mr. Vladimir. Mr. Vladimir, I'm back. And I am going. I have decided to return to Bulgaria, this time for good. My dinner, she is ruined. First the soup, and now the main course. It should have been Pastanovich, made with the best spaghetti, and now it looks more like mashed potatoes. I wish you the best Mitzi Lock. Goodbye. Oh, said Paddington. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, God. Here's that comedian again. Know any good potato jokes? <laughs> I could do with another good laugh. I don't think you'll feel much like laughing after you've eaten this, said Paddington. Anyway, it's not potato. It's called Spagpot. It looks like mashed potato, but it's made of spaghetti. Do you serve snails? Paddington consulted his book. We serve anyone, he exclaimed. What are you doing now? asked Mrs. Smith Chomley anxiously. I'm looking for the end, said Paddington. But spaghetti has lots of ends. I don't think this lot has, said Paddington. Oh, dear, I think I found a knot. Splendid, splendid. <laughs> no any more tricks? Paddington's eyes gleamed. He picked up his book and opened it at a carefully marked page. 
It was headed, Tricks to do in an emergency. And it seemed an ideal moment to try one of them out. There's a very good one here, he announced. I haven't actually tried doing it before, but... What's it called? Paddington consulted his book again. It's called The Pulling a Tablecloth Away from the Table While Leaving All the Valuable Dishes Unbroken Trick. Oh, dear. Haven't you got something like pulling a rabbit out of a hat? Or... Don't worry, Mrs Chomley. There's a picture of someone doing it in the instructions. It looks very easy. All you do is take hold of the tablecloth with both paws and give it a sharp tug, like so. <laughs> I think I found the rest of the ends, said Paddington. Perhaps you'd like to come and help yourself. Paddington didn't sleep very well that night, and when he arrived down for breakfast the next morning, he half expected to find Mrs. Smith Chomley waiting for him. But having made sure the coast was clear, he sat down and found to his surprise that instead of his usual boiled egg, there was a large blue envelope awaiting him. It looked most important. Hurry up and open it, said Judy. We're dying to know what's inside. It didn't come by mail. It was sent by hand. It's from a Mrs. Smith Chomley. She said you would know all about it. She's the one who's always in the papers. She's famous for her surprise parties. Oh, said Paddington. Is anything the matter, Paddington? You've gone quite pale. I'm not sure, Mr Brown, said Paddington ominously. I may leave it until after breakfast. I'm not sure I want any more surprises. But Paddington's suggestion met with such a chorus of protest, he had to give in. Inside the envelope, there was a large white card with a gold edge all around it, and a letter. Well, come on, said Judy. Tell us all about it. I've been invited to a ball, exclaimed Paddington. A ball, repeated Mr Brown. Are you sure you want to go, dear? Paddington gave Mrs Brown a hard stare. Not go, he repeated. I've never been to a ball before. Besides, this is a very special one. It's going to be on television and there's a special cash prize for the best dancers of the evening. Mrs. Smith Chomley wants me to do some more of my tricks at the party tonight. She thinks they might raise a lot of money. Party? What party? Do you know anything about a party, Mary? Besides, today's my birth... Shh! Henry, may I be excused, please, Mr. Brown? I think I'll finish the rest of my breakfast upstairs, if you don't mind. If I'm going to a ball tonight, I'd better start practising some of my steps. That's all we need. What a way to spend a birthday. Paddington consulted some instructions in Mr. Gruber's book. There were lots of pictures comparing the various dance steps with the hands on a clock. But no sooner had he got his feet pointing towards a quarter past four than it was time to change them to five minutes to seven. It was all very confusing. He was glad he was using a pillow for a partner. It saved him from the worst of the bumps. Paddington! Are you all right? Yes, said Paddington. And then again... <coughs> no. I think I might go back to bed for a while. After all, I want to be at my best tonight. I might win a prize. Fancy Paddington's ball being on television, said Mrs. Brown. Look, exclaimed Mrs. Bird, he's just arrived. Mr. Paddington Brown, from darkest to parole. What on earth's he doing with his shopping cart? He had rather a lot to take. There's his book of instructions and a pillow. A pillow, repeated Mr. Brown. It's in case no one asks him to dance, said Mrs. Brown. You wouldn't want him to be a wallflower, would you, Henry? Anything less like a wallflower than Paddington would be hard to imagine. What's he up to now? Would you care to leave your duffel coat, sir? Leave my duffel coat, exclaimed Paddington. It's got my lucky number on the back. I'll undo it if you like. Oh, dear, sir, what have we done? We haven't done anything, said Paddington, looking most upset. I'm having trouble with Mr Brown's shoulder. My best shirt, exclaimed Mr. Brown. 
Now where's he gone? Mrs. Brown needn't have worried. Paddington and the cameras seem to have a fatal fascination for each other. Several times he appeared, raising his hat to the viewers at home. And once they caught a glimpse of him sitting on his suitcase, eating a marmalade sandwich. If you ask me, he's working up to something, said Mrs. Bird. I know the signs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Forum Ballroom. I'm Seymour Ward, your host for the evening. And for the viewers at home, may I introduce our judges, Norman and Hilda Castle, and Miss Iris Grangemouth and her partner, Alonzo. Miss Grangemouth is wearing a dress which is adorned with over 10,000 sequins. Our orchestra tonight is under the baton of Alf Wiedersee. And now we come to the highest spot of the evening, the contest for the best dancers. Ladies and gentlemen, take your partners, please. The most point so far is 64. Can anyone beat that? Take it away, Al. Look, there's Paddington. I wonder where he's off to now, exclaimed Judy. Isn't that Mrs. Smith Chomley? asked Mrs. Brown. Don't tell me he's going to ask her for a dance. There's nothing like jumping in at the deep end. Bears often do, said Mrs. Bird. Jumping's right. Look at them. The Browns stared at their screen in amazement. It was almost as if Paddington and Mrs. Smith Chomley had received a sudden charge of electricity. I must say this is the most spectacular display of dancing I've seen for a long time. The joint is really jumping tonight. All the other dancers have stopped to watch. Alfredo Zane is beside himself. Good old Paddington. Who would have believed it? I wonder what the judges will say. Maximum points, four tens. That makes 40 points. Wherever did you learn to dance like that? I didn't exactly learn, said Paddington. I was having trouble with my alarm clock. Your alarm clock? I'm afraid I don't understand. It was tickling me. I think it must have gone off by mistake. I usually set it for half past eight in case I'm late for breakfast. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for a complete change of mood, all the grace and style of the waltz leading into the excitement of the rumba. Well, I must say, Mrs. Smith Chomley's smile looks a trifle fixed. Do you think anything's wrong? I can feel something crawling down my back. <laughs> There's an awful creature. I know there is. Do something. <laughs> it's all wet and sticky. It, it looks like a worm. It's all right, Mrs. Chomley. Don't worry. It isn't a worm. It's a marmalade chunk. I must have dropped my marmalade sandwich down the back of your dress by mistake. A marmalade sandwich? Hold on, exclaimed Paddington. I'll try to get it back. You'll do no such thing. Leave me alone. Help! Help! These two really do move as one, but don't forget, they need 25 points for a win.
I think this must be one of yours, Miss Grangemouth, exclaimed Paddington. A smashing finale! I can't see what their score is. Oh, yes! 25 points! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the winners! <laughs> and now, as well as this magnificent cup, I have pleasure in presenting to Mrs. Smith Chomley and Mr. Paddington Brown from darkest Peru a cash prize of £25 each. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Brown. May I ask, what are you going to do with the money? I shall use it to give Mr. Brown a birthday surprise. Wonderful. Perhaps we could have a chorus of happy birthday in Mr. Brown's honour. Just a moment, please, Mr. Wiedersehen. I've got an even better idea. Fancy Paddington remembering my birthday after all, said Mr. Brown. I was beginning to think he'd forgotten about it. That would be most unlike him. I wonder what he'll do. It's too late to buy anything. All the shops will be closed. We shall all have to wait and see. Bears are good at surprises. Knowing Paddington, he's bound to think of something unusual. <laughs> said Mr. Brown, is the nicest present anyone could possibly have on their birthday.